You're going to do the same exact thing as before, but you're going to be sure to substitute back in for you before you evaluate. So method number one is don't change bounds, sub in for you at the end. Don't change the balance. Substitute back in for you before you evaluate. And you'll see exactly what I mean on this example. There you go. Okay, let's look at the integral. This is the first time we've had like a honest to goodness integral with some numbers up there and, and something that was, wasn't just super, super basic. So this looks like a real integral with some real numbers and some honest work to do. First thing, could you distribute everything out? You could. You really could in this example. You probably wouldn't want to though because that's a power of three. It's going to take, take you a long time. So substitution in this case would probably be your best bet. Ignore the bounds when you're picking your substitution. It's just a basic integral, just like you did with indefinite integrals. Pick the correct substitution. Why don't you do that now? At this point, I'm hoping that most of the substitutions are pretty obvious. The only times they might be, maybe wouldn't be is uh, with some of the square roots. Sometimes people forget about that. Or with trig functions. Sometimes they're not obvious. You have to guess and check. So, you. What's u? Good. What's du? Don't forget the dx. You, you need the dx. And then how I've taught you how to do this is I've had you solve for dx. That makes the substitution nice and neat. So solve for dx, you're going to get du over 2x equals dx. You okay with this so far? Everybody? Okay. Now what do we do? So we're going to have, what are we going to have? Why don't you tell me exactly? 4x u cubed. Okay, I heard 4x. What did you say after that? U cubed. Perfect. And then what? And then du over 2x. Excellent. From 2 to 0. Okay, we're going to talk about that in a second. First thing, how many people feel okay with our substitution? 4x is still there for right now. The u cubed comes from u cubed dx. No, 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 not dx anymore du over 2x, and then we start simplifying things. And then Michael said it, uh, something interesting from 0 to 2. Um, yes and, and kind of no. Yes and no. We're going to put it there. But I want to show you why method 2 uh, can, can do something different for you. Because as soon as you do this, from 0 to 2, as soon as you do that from 0 to 2, look what's going to happen. Sure, you're going to eliminate this 2 and that's going to become a 2, yeah? Mm -hmm. And you're going to eliminate this x and this x. Mm -hmm. And what you would get is 0 to 2 with a 2 out in front of it. Do you see where the 2 out in front of it is coming from? Mm -hmm. That 2 pull out front. u cubed du. Which variable? Which variable? u. Yes, it's u. Not u, u. <laughs> it's u. What were these bounds originally in? So we kind of have bounds that don't match our integral right now, which is sometimes leads to problems because what people do often is they'll do this. They'll go, okay, hey, I know how to take an integral. It's very easy. I'm going to have 2 u to the fourth over 4, and then they do this. Explain to me why that might be incorrect. Right. These are in terms of x, right? But the integral makes it seem like you're plugging them in for u. Now, you can do it this way. You can. You really can. Provided that you do one thing. Provided that you don't change the bounds. We didn't change the bounds. And substitute back in for u before evaluating. So not here. 
this would be the wrong way to go. Do you see why it's the wrong way to go? Honestly, do you see it? Yeah. You're trying to plug in X's for U's. That's not going to happen. So instead, we're going to do a little bit of simplification still. We're going to get U to the fourth over 2. And you all said that you're going to substitute back in for U in terms of X before you plug this in. You see, if these are in terms of X, I want my function to be in terms of X, my integral to be in terms of X, what I got to be in terms of X before I evaluate. So we'll substitute back in for the U. We'll get our X to the second minus 1, all to the fourth power, then over 2, and at this point, this is where I should evaluate. So right here, you know, that's a little bit cramped up there. Now we get to go from 0 to 2. That's OK. That says, now that we have this in terms of x, great. They match up with our x bounds that we started with. Now plug in the 2, plug in the 0. Why don't you do that and see what you get? Don't neglect that zero. Zero squared minus one isn't zero, so you're going to get something over there. Signed area. Good. We haven't talked about absolute value or anything. Um, not sure if that one's going to have a, any negative area. If you graphed on a graphing calculator, you, you could tell. Or if you wanted to find out total area, what you would have to do is find out whether that's above or below the x-axis for all of those points. I'm not sure in, in either case. Maybe you can look at that. But you'd have the absolute value for total area. You remember doing that from last time? The absolute value, you take this, you set it equal to zero, you'd have your endpoints and any points in between there that would change the sign of that thing, and you separate those two angles, and that's how you do that problem. So this actually is net signed area, whether or not we have it all above or, or below. And this, if it was all above the x-axis, net signed area would be total area. But if there's any area below the x-axis, it would have automatically subtracted in there for us. So that's the case. By the way, does anyone graph that? Do you know if there is any area below the x-axis between zero and two? I guess we could find out real quick. Between zero and two? Yes, sir. Yeah, there is. Between zero and one, it looks like. This is negative? Yeah. Okay. So it looks like, I mean, there's a little portion like that, just a little bit on the side of the road, it looks like. Well. See? <laughs> there you can see. Yeah, we have a, a little bit below the x-axis between 0 and 2, so that's going to be counted against our area right here. Um, so this is actually total, not, not total area, this is net sign area. It's discounting the part between 0 and 1, and then we have from 1 to 2 that would actually be positive, but it's greater than the negative area. That's why we have a positive 40 out of that. And we feel okay with that so far. Very right, cool. Would it be substantially harder to do that? Substantially harder to break them up? Not really. It's, it's actually just a matter of separating our integral going from 0 to 1 and having the negative in front of that. 
and then going from one to two and doing it just like we just did. You just plug in some different numbers. So it's not that much harder, just you have to do the integral twice. So I don't want to do that right here because we have to change bounds a lot in the next, next example, but that would be something to talk about. Are you okay with, uh, with this first example? Do you understand the idea of not changing bounds? Basically the same exact thing uh, you do for every example. You just don't change the bounds, you do the integral like you normally would, change it back into x like you normally would, and then plug the numbers in. That's the first method. Second method says, well, maybe there's maybe not necessarily a quicker way. It's not quicker. Maybe we can just do it a different way. In either way, notice that you're going to be plugging these numbers in. You will be plugging in 0, and you will be plugging in 2. You should do it a different time. So we're going to talk about method 2. I'll show you how that works. Do you have a preference on which method? I'll tell you which method to use on the test when I want you to use it. If I don't tell you a method, you do whatever method you want. Okay? So we should learn both methods. You must use it to learn both methods. Yeah. Okay, method two. Method two is you change bounds. You change bounds during your first substitution. If that's the case, here's what I'll give you like a, a little foreshadowing what's going to happen. You're going to change your bounds from x's into terms of u using your substitution. If you change your bounds into terms of u, do you need to substitute back in at this point for x? No, no because they'll be in terms of u. So if you do method two, you change your bounds, and then you do not substitute back in before evaluation. It's the same. Tell you what, let's do the same example. Can we do the same example? Just do it a different way. So you can see I'm not full of smoke here. It really does work out. I'm not here to reteach you how to do substitution. I've already taught you everything you need to know. Uh, that's that's not doesn't change, so that's nice. You'll still use the same substitutions no matter what. What I'm here to tell you is there's a slightly different way to do it. So if we pick the same substitution u. U is still x squared minus 1, and hey, du is still 2x dx, and sure enough, du over 2x is still going to equal dx. That doesn't change at all. You still okay with that? Here's the change. The change says, well, since we're substituting everything anyway, I mean, we're substituting this for you, this x part for you, and this x part for you, why not just do the bounds as well? Why don't we substitute those things for you as well? And here's how to do it. All right, well, that's, that's a good idea, Mr. Leonard. Let's try. Mm -hmm. Boy, here's the point. When you look at that, that says x is going to become 2. That says x is going to become 0. Why don't you find out what u would be when x becomes 2 and u becomes 0? And that's the, that's the question. Notice how we're actually doing that right here. We're plugging in 2, 2. We're plugging in 0, 0. It's just within the evaluation process. 